carbon dioxide emissions, the same amount as aviation. So for those of you who feel good that you rode your bike to this conference as opposed to flying an airplane to this conference, you probably nevertheless found out about it via one of the world's major polluters. US server farms use 1.5% of the national electricity supply at a cost of $4.5 billion annually. Moving to the less sexy end of the new media, high-end magazine publishing in this country needs about 35 million trees annually to produce 18 million titles, 90% of which are trashed within a year of publication. Wildlife I poisoned by toxic emissions from technology. Communications towers and wires kill up to 50 million birds a year in the US. Statistics that used to be kept by the Federal Communications Commission until the Bush administration. There is a rising body burden of toxins caused by discarded electronics and risks persist from radiation poisoning by TVs, computer monitors, cell phones, laptops, telecommunications and electrical towers and power lines. Communication satellites discharge toxic chemicals, compounds and nuclear waste, while media related nanotechnology emits toxic byproducts that remain poorly understood at the atomic scale. Yet media owners promote themselves as leading edge green citizens. We are forever being told this is the end of the era of the smokestack, of modernity, of the industrial, of manufacturing. This is the clean green era, era of the new. For example, in 2007, Rupert Murdoch convened a meeting of all his employees across the world, the first and only one ever. The sole agenda item was his goal of making News Corporation carbon neutral by 2010 despite the company's annual usage of almost 650,000 tons of such fuels. It is surreal to hear, as you can if you go to the web page, Mr. Murdoch tell his employees that, I quote, if we are to connect with our audiences on this issue, we must first get our own house in order, and, I quote again, climate change poses clear, catastrophic threats, unquote. At the same time as, of course, these very findings or announcements are derided on his very profitable Fox News channel as quote-unquote junk science. So what would this mean for people largely, but not exclusively, such as ourselves, involved in academia within the human sciences, as opposed to people involved in the media industries themselves and in ecolog ecological, environmental, technological innovation and regulation? Clearly, the human sciences have made major contributions to media aspects of the three kinds of citizenship that I enumerate, the political, the economic, and the cultural. But we've been essentially silent on the media and the environment because most of us buy into, whether implicitly or explicitly, a quasi habermasian notion of more is better in terms of discourse. Many of us use this, for example, as an alibi for why we are opposed to censorship. Don't strike down discussion, elicit more discussion. One of the founding mythologies of U.S. patrimony is the town hall meeting and the freedom of will to speak. When it comes to being self-reflexive about our complicity in environmental despoliation, we're just starting to address the impact of electronic waste or waste. Neither media technology, though, nor those who study it, rate highly in most policy discussions about the environment. And the human sciences barely rate as anything much at all in the eyes of the media themselves or national governments. In fact, the human sciences, and media studies in particular, are often deemed to be talking rubbish. Well, I quite like this idea of talking rubbish. I think we should talk more rubbish and make a virtue of it. I have in mind the trashing of media technology, both as an object of research, seeing media technologies as dirty industrial products that are toxic from design to disposal and contribute to climate change, and as an ethos or attitude towards our beloved gadgetry. To undertake this trashing, we can draw on existing discourses of the human sciences, linking a new media eco-ethics to feminism and critical race theory, articulated to eco-feminism and environmental justice, respectively. Such work should be at the center of what we do and directly articulated to citizenship, but standing in our way is the fetish. Vincent Mosco has shown that the tendency to see each new emergent medium of communications as awe-inspiring and world-changing relies on recurring myths of technological power. The long history of this technological fetish was first indexed, to my knowledge, 
by René Descartes in his defiant 1637 apologia for choosing to write in French rather than Latin in search of audiences who would turn away from old books. This demotic faith in new media and new genres was solidified by Johann Kleiling's lecture in Germany in 1702, which alleged that teaching would be transformed forever by the magic lantern. That utopia continues with, of course, dystopic corollaries. In the 1920s, Germany and Australia saw trade union-owned radio stations pioneering call or response via a two-way system, a Brechtian project of worker-actor collaboration across the ether. And speaking of the ether, this mystical substance was allotted all kinds of bizarre properties by early practitioners, such as contact with the dead and cures for cancer. TV. In a 1930 edition of the Daily Worker newspaper, Samuel Brody argued that television in the Soviet Union would build socialism and a better world for the laboring masses. Five years later, Rudolf Arnheim predicted that TV would offer viewers simultaneous global experiences, from railway disasters, professorial addresses, and town <coughs> meetings, to boxing title fights, dance bands, carnivals, and aerial mountain views, a spectacular montage of Athens, Broadway, and Vesuvius. A common vision would surpass the limitations of linguistic competence and interpretation. This new media would overcome differences and create global peace by showing us we are located as one among many. Does this remind you of any of the discourse of the 1990s? Each media innovation has promised people more of what they never knew they needed commercially, at the same time as promising new possibilities democratically. Such are the dreams of today's cybertarians and the idea that the individual can control destiny through the internet. These dreams are fueled and sometimes created by multinational marketers only too keen to stoke the fires of aesthetic and autotelic desire, as when Apple refers to its iMac as a modern art installation. But these are lethal as well as blissful fantasies. They represent risk, and fetishistic investments in the media obscure rather than illuminate the ecological crisis. For example, most iPod people, I'm an iPod person, most iPod people don't know that iPod production exposes workers in at least four different countries to mercury, lead, and flame retardant. <coughs> Ethical media consumption is very difficult when components with distinct production histories are bundled together. They may be made and assembled all over the planet, and it's tough to track their individual and composite production histories, unlike consumer action against simpler merchandise, such as sporting apparel. Nor do iPod people know why iPod batteries are made to last a year, or why iPhones can often only be recharged 250 times. The awesomeness of the iPod doesn't lend itself to understanding that built-in obsolescence requires consumers to buy, wherever possible, replacements and not just new batteries. If we maintain our fetishistic habits, citizenship will be complicit in the collective refusal to face up to our ecological crisis, to counter that trap we must see the media industries as environmental participants, not merely as signifying agents of information <coughs> or pleasure. The media are not just things to be read. They are not just coefficients of political and economic power. They are not just objects to be understood through instrumental rationality. They are hybrid monsters, coevally subject to rhetoric, status, and technology, to text, power, and science, all at once, but in contingent ways. And we need to analyze media corporations as polluters. A brief outline of 